All right, we are ready to get started. Hello, everyone. So pleased you are able to join us today for this latest session. This is the third in a series of educational safety leadership webinars brought to you by Caterpillar and Caterpillar Safety Services. I'm Rusty Dunn from Caterpillar's Enterprise Communications team, a privilege to be your moderator and guide through today's discussion. Welcome to all of you joining us from around the United States and around the world uh, through Facebook and YouTube. We have had great feedback and participation in the first two webinars. We're hoping for the same today, so thank you for being here. Well, today we are honing in on how you as a leader can demonstrate true commitment to safety in your company or your business uh, and talk about those cultural trademarks of what makes a world-class class safety organization and how is it that you as a leader can help your company uh, get there. Um, so when it comes to taking safety from the, the front office to the front line, you're going to hear some practical advice and to-dos and some great tactical guidance on how to get there. And you're going to hear it. You heard it if you've joined us in those first two webinars, leadership and safety go hand in hand, and you're certainly going to hear it today. And there's no one better to help us connect those dots uh, than today's presenter, my friend and colleague, Justin Ganshaw, who is the business development manager for Caterpillar Safety Services. Uh, Justin, welcome. Hope you are doing well. Thanks for being here. Great to see you. I am doing great, and there's no other place I'd rather be. Thanks for having me. Well, before we get off and running, Justin, and, and you've got a full presentation today and some great exercises, and we want everyone be, to be prepared and present to sort of um, look inward to answer some really key questions that I know you're going to challenge them, them with. I always think it's, it's nice to sort of set the table and talk about what you do as business development manager for Caterpillar Safety Services um, before we get into that discussion, sort of your personal and professional mission day in and day out. I would be happy to share that. I've sort of become unintentionally a safety prophet. I travel throughout the land and spread the message of how to build and sustain cultures of safety excellence. And it's never something that I thought I would end up doing, but it's become my mission. It's become my passion. Uh, so in uh, as the business development manager, it's sort of a combination between research, product development, marketing and sales and it's just every day is a lot of fun well as we get into the discussion a reminder to all of you participating today that we welcome your comments your questions throughout justin's presentation and our discussion and we're going to share some of um, those comments and questions during the course of the next hour or so also don't worry the presentation and the other presentations from the previous webinars are available through the qr code you will see on this slide presentation. Also, cat.com slash safety leadership uh, has uh, all of that great material and additional information as well. So with that, Justin, what do you think? Let's get started. Let's get started. Safety is deeply rooted in our culture at Caterpillar. It's one of our core values, and it's one of the first things that a new team member at Caterpillar experiences. It's something that we often hear from our visitors. If you've ever toured a cat facility, you've probably seen it. Safety is something that's visible. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, safety is something that we've developed intentionally. It didn't just happen by accident. It's something that's been honed over the years at each of our facilities and personally by the leaders that run those facilities. Safety doesn't just happen. Caterpillar is also a continuous improvement focused company and our focus on safety has been no different. We seek to build better, more efficient, more powerful machines for our customers and also to build a safer, more effective, more efficient safety culture for our team members. One of my favorite factory managers that I worked with in the past used to say, we won't build a single tractor if it means putting somebody's life at risk. We here at Caterpillar have been on and continue to be on a journey to safety excellence. It was about 10 years ago, if you go to the next slide, please, we, we'd been on this journey and we realized that we had made up a lot of ground. We had made a lot of improvements. We were actually one of the leaders in our industry when it came to safety. 
but we were struggling with a lot of safety management aches and pains, even though we had great intentions. Safety was a priority, but we were still struggling with some of the things that you see on the screen right now. We were struggling with employee ownership. Employees certainly cared about their own safety, but they didn't know how to demonstrate that they owned safety out there on the shop floor. Similarly, our supervisors certainly cared about the safety of their teams, but they didn't know how to be safety leaders. Maybe they were checking the box to satisfy some requirement, but they weren't taking ownership. They weren't driving change in safety leadership. Connected to them were our managers. Managers didn't know how to be involved in safety other than responding to incidents or similarly checking boxes. It wasn't something that they were proactively managing. And all of this led to a sense of production over safety mentality. We had also plateaued in our safety results after about 10 years of really good improvements. And we plateaued at a level that was not acceptable to anyone because we were still injuring about 1% of our workforce. And while that was better than our peers in our industry of heavy equipment manufacturing, it wasn't good enough. When it comes to safety, you're never done improving. And what we realized was that these were not unique safety aches and pains to Caterpillar. As we at Safety Services start to serve customers in a lot of different industries, we serve over 15 industries today, we realize that these are common safety management aches and pains. Regardless of your industry, regardless of the size of your organization, we all struggle at some level with these safety management aches and pains. And as we take a step back and we look for that common thread, what is it? Well, it's leadership. And Rusty already said it. Safety and leadership go hand in hand. Leaders aren't just born. Most of us aren't born with these innate abilities to lead people. It's something that has to be practiced, trained, coached over time if we want our people to be true safety leaders. Not just somebody with a safety title, but everybody that has people that work for them. Leaders then need to live out these behaviors from the top of the organization through middle management to line supervision and those employees out there that are closest to the risks. And then safety management has to be operationalized, just like production and quality. And we'll talk about how to do that in a few minutes. And Justin, let me ask you to maybe explain, uh, and that was a great slide with all those different boxes that you have to connect that all thread together, um, but explain a little bit what a, and I think I know what it looks like. A, a leader out there may say, I, I know what you're going for, but you know, what's that strong and effective safety culture truly entail and to keep it going? Well, it's first say that there's no one right way to manage safety. But we've been working with companies for over 40 years, and we find some commonalities. Those companies that have the most positive, sustained safety cultures have a few things in common. And regardless of the industry, it all starts at the top. Our safety culture guru was a guy named Dr. Dan Peterson, and he was, he was a pioneer in this field. And he followed in the footsteps of W. Edwards Deming and the quality revolution uh, in manufacturing following World War II. And Dr. Peterson, in, in one of his final interviews before he passed away, said leaders must learn that they have to do things on a regular basis to develop the culture that produces safe behaviors. And Rusty, I'll ask you, and those that are following along, you can put this in the chat or the comment section. What are some of those things that leaders have to do? Any guesses? Yeah. Yeah, and there, and there are probably a lot of things out there, I'm guessing, but I, I have to think near the top of the list uh, for one thing would be setting good setting examples. I mean, in, in terms of illustrating the point you want to make, but setting a good example, um, what we've talked about in a previous webinar, good communication, communicating effectively. That's where it's got to start. You have to set those expectations and make sure that they happen. What we often see is that while executives have really great intentions, sometimes they put those expectations of things to happen on the shoulders of someone at a specific level of the organization. Any guesses as to where those typically fall? I'm going to guess it's down, down below somewhere. A lot of boxes there. A lot of boxes. What we see is that it often falls on the shoulders of those frontline supervisors, which makes sense right. because they're the ones that are out there with the people in the trenches closest to the risk or onto those with safety in their job title. Well, let's talk about the potential pitfalls if we do that. 
If we set those expectations only at the supervisor level, that will in turn influence the behaviors of the craft or the hourly employees out there in the field, the ones that are actually doing the work. But who sets the expectations for the daily, weekly, monthly activities of the supervisors? It's someone in management, someone in mid-level management often. And there's usually more levels above those, those frontline managers. So if the managers are driving different expectations other than safe production with measurable activities, then the supervisors in turn are going to be managing other things. Maybe that is more focused on production or quality or customer satisfaction or schedule. If we place those daily responsibilities for safety on the shoulders of a safety professional or a safety manager, we're also in trouble potentially because guess what? Operations doesn't report to the safety department. They have little influence right. over what actually happens out there on the front line when they're not around. So, so safety Justin, is something that has to be uh, managed with set expectations at every level of the organization. And what we typically Justin, see if we don't have those expectations set is the following. An injury occurs. Management, and this is part of their job, and it's because they care, they react to that injury. But what we tend to see as a result of this reaction is a flurry of safety activities. Safety now becomes really important. So we see things like, um, go ahead and animate there, more training. But was it really a lack of education that led to the injury or was there something more at stake? It's not that we don't do training, but we have to do something beyond that because we've probably already trained them. Or we focus on things like more audits. We get out there in the field and we look for every hazard that we can find. We bubble wrap it uh, to pr try to prevent future incidents and we should be mitigating hazards, but that's not enough. Or we focus on compliance. But you can be 100% compliant with every regulatory rule and policy and still be unsafe. And we'll talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. Or we turn to discipline, trying to correct the behaviors of individuals. And we crack down on them. We come up with all these really complex ways to coach and discipline people. But what it tends to do is drive the reporting of minor things underground. And if we don't respond to the minor incidents or opportunities for improvement, it leaves the organization exposed to much larger, more serious incidents in the future. So we should not be turning to discipline on a routine basis to correct behaviors. Or we write more programs, develop more policies, come up with more procedures as if we don't have enough already. And we get a bigger and bigger stack of things we should be doing as a, in a reactionary state. Or we hire more safety professionals thinking that safety is their job alone, or we replace the ones we have, sorry guys and, and ladies, but safety can't fall to them alone. And what we've realized is that doing more of the same thing we've tried for decades is not gonna get us to a better place. We have to put those tools aside and do something different because after a while, we go right back to business as usual as things die down, quiet down, and we start to focus on what we normally focus on, which is productivity, quality or those other aspects of our business. Does any of that sound familiar? It, absolutely. And it sort of makes that larger point, Justin. Um, if there isn't that acute personal focus on safety at the top with the connections uh, down to, through each level of that organization, it's hard to expect. Your it comes to our results. If you go to the next slide, this is what an organization's injury rate will look like if that's the way that we're managing safety in a reactionary knee-jerk fashion. So our injury rate might decrease after we have that flurry of activities, we crack down on behaviors, uh, and we scare the heck out of people when it comes to safety. It probably has devolved our culture, and then we see another spike. And then we see those numbers go down again. We might get uh, a little complacent, resting on our laurels. Maybe we start to siphon resources away from safety because we've gotten better, and then it goes up again. And I don't think our stockholders would appreciate financial results like this and our employees and our leaders I'm sure don't don't like to see safety results like this but this is possible if our leaders don't really understand what's causing injuries in the first place so here's our first little quiz what do you think causes most injuries directly is it hazardous conditions or is it at risk behaviors you can put that in the chat box there and Rusty, I'm going to ask you to answer that question. What do you think? You know, you know, absolutely. I think we all sort of go back and look at our own situations, look at ourselves, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it, it has to be behaviors. I think it's behaviors. Well, 
You're right. It's at-risk behaviors. Now, follow-up question. What percentage of incidents do you believe are caused by those at-risk behaviors? I would think it's I would think it's going to be high, but probably a window, maybe not 99 percent, but probably in that window of 80 to 90 percent and probably toward more toward 90. Second gold star of the day for you, Rusty. Yeah, 90 plus percent of incidents are caused directly by at risk behaviors. Now, I want you to think about how safety has traditionally been managed. Just about every organization complies with government regulations because it's the law. We have to do that. That's what we usually hire safety professionals to help us do is to know and interpret rules and regulations. And that's a good thing. But do those regulations apply to hazardous conditions or at-risk behaviors? Yeah, I would would have to think as they come in to uh, monitor or inspect, you're looking at um, not behaviors. It, that has to be almost exclusive to conditions. Yes. Yes. It's all about conditions. And then we write safety policies. We develop procedures to keep us in compliance with the government regulations that are focused on conditions. We train our employees on what those policies and procedures are to keep us in compliance with regulations that are focused on conditions. We go out as safety professionals and managers. We do audits and inspections. What we're typically looking at are conditions. So we've spent almost 100% of our time managing safety around controlling and mitigating hazardous conditions. And I'm not saying that any of that is bad. We've gotten as good as we are today as industry because we focused on managing and mitigating those hazardous conditions. But what are we doing for the 90%? What are we doing to change and shape our organizational behaviors around safety? We have to get at the root cause. So the root cause, let's talk about that. We've already established that incidents are caused mostly by at-risk behaviors. If you go to the next slide, please. Why do you think people take risks? Why do those at-risk behaviors exist? And and I'm going to say, Justin, to jump jump in, and and some folks may be thinking the same, uh, because they're in a hurry. you think nothing bad's going to happen. You're trying to get it done. I've done it this way a hundred times before. What could possibly happen? Absolutely right. We have these individually held attitudes, beliefs, and ideas about why our behavior in a, in a specific situation is okay. We make conscious decisions about what to do when no one's watching based on our, our personal experience. I've done it this way a hundred times. Nobody's ever said anything. Nothing bad has ever happened to me. Those are personal things that reinforce our behaviors in the moment. But then when we take a step back, we have these team or these department or these company-wide norms, these organizational practices that are commonly accepted. And the norms reinforce those attitudes, beliefs, and ideas collectively. So in a traditional safety management system, when an employee takes a risk and they get injured, Management tends to step in and we coach, we discipline, we terminate the employee as an individual, but we haven't addressed the root cause. The root cause is the culture, and that is shaped by leaders. And if we're only focusing on the direct cause, the at-risk behavior, then we are living out of a reactionary, unintentional safety culture space. So What can we do about that? How do we change a culture that has been developed over years or decades? Well, we have to be intentional. Let's look at how proactive culture works. When we work together as a team to establish proactive, positive norms around safety leading indicator activities, it will develop and reinforce positive attitudes, beliefs, and ideas about safety. And guess what? This is probably not a big surprise, but safety is not always positively perceived especially if you spent all your career focusing on all of the bad things or only talking about safety after something bad has happened. If we're talking about positive things, it's a lot easier to do psychologically. So we do it more often if we're talking about positive things. That establishes safer behaviors because we're talking about it more frequently. It's a simple equation. Whatever you talk about the most, your employees will perceive as most important to you as a leader. Those safer behaviors in turn drive more positive safety results. This is a reflection of proactive, intentional safety culture. And guess what? It takes a lot more work. But what we have learned in our business 
going on almost five decades now and helping cult, uh, companies transform their culture and leadership is that those companies that have the best safety culture have these six things in common. This was established by Dr. Peterson. Number one, our top leaders are visibly committed to improving safety. That means they're setting expectations. As you said, when we started off this section, they're setting those expectations. They're out there visibly demonst demonstrating those expectations through what they say, through what they do, as Abby told us in our last session. They're wearing the same gear as the employees when they're in the same situations. They're also measuring the performance of those that report to them and ensuring that we have that system of accountability all the way to the front line, which we'll talk about in a minute. So one level down is our mid-level managers. They also have to be visibly committed if we expect anybody else below them in the org chart to believe that safety is just as important as productivity and quality and everything else that we measure. So they have to be actively involved. They have to have prescribed safety activities that they're accountable for, just like those below them. Let's go to the next level down with our frontline supervisors. When it comes to safety, they have to be performance focused. And we measure our supervisors on all kinds of things that they do out there in the shop, on the construction site, in the quarry, in the hospital. Regardless of your industry, our supervisors have a lot to manage. So they should be measured on their performance of safety activities. What about our frontline employees? We certainly expect them to work safely. We expect them to follow those established safety protocols and participate in the safety activities. But what we found works much more effectively is allowing them to be a part of the development of the safety activities that govern how they work every day. You get a lot more buy-in and support for the way we run our safety meetings or the way we onboard new employees or the way we do lockout tagout. If they're a part of developing those protocols, so they have to be actively participating in creating the safety culture that they live within. Number five is that we are flexible and we work with a lot of corporate customers that have many locations. And a temptation is to uh, develop one way of do doing a safety activity and apply it everywhere, which is great for efficiency. It's not so great for engagement and buy-in. So we have to allow flexibility in the way that safety activities are applied across an organization, across departments, across shifts. What is not flexible is that some people get out of it. Everyone's gonna do the safety activities, but how they're applied should be flexible. And if you do those first five things, what we found is that most often the safety culture is positively perceived by everyone that works within that system. And that's what we want. So companies that do these six things are often the most successful. So that was kind of a long-winded answer to your question, what does good look like? But I hope that provided some insight. It, it does. And it's, a, it's an, an awesome foundation for the, you know, laying down that understanding of how leadership, leaders, influence, culture, and safety. So maybe uh, sort of a tactical question, Justin, in terms of how leaders can individually contribute um, to improving it? Sort of that practical question. Yeah, and I'm going to start with a question to that question. Uh, it's about how our leaders influence the employee decisions out there on the front line. So here's the question. And if you are on Facebook, you've probably seen pop up uh, down at the bottom of the screen in the comment section, a few choices. If you're on YouTube, you can put your response in the comment section. What percent of employees believe that management expects them to take unnecessary risks to get the work done? Is it A, 12%, B, 34%, C, 51%, or D, 78%? No, that's a, that's a great question. You'd like to assume it's the lowest, but I wouldn't assume that at all. We'll give uh, folks a, a few seconds to, to maybe take a shot at that. A question, though, Justin, on, on the question itself in terms of management expecting to, uh, people to take unnecessary risks to get the work done. Are you talking about work on the job site, construction site, in the office, or is it across the board in terms of the type of work setting with that question? Across the board, across industries, it's really a reflection of the either intentional or unintentional way that that culture has been developed. Interesting, and it's it, the other point being that employees will will do what they they think is most important to what 
their boss says or does or what they assume they want them to do. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, we've got so we'll put it up for just a few more seconds. Again, I'd like to assume it's 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 low, and I know the answer, so I, I'm admitting right now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> give give the answer. Um, okay, let's go ahead and we have consensus. See what that is. We may have something coming in here in terms of uh, some thoughts. Okay. Well, it, so this is interesting, Justin. It looks like 31% think it's uh, – now we've got the majority saying 78% actually. 78% or 47% of uh, the respondents think that 78% is the, the right answer, answer D. On YouTube, it's 51%. So – we're at the top of the range there, but let's see what let's see what the answer is. The answer is our YouTubers got it right this morning. Fifty one point two percent of employees believe management expects them to take unnecessary risks to get the work done. Well, if that's surprising to you, uh, I want you to think about the messages that are sent by our leaders. What are they communicating about? the most? Have they set those expectations? You know, here at Caterpillar Safety Services back in 2012, we wanted to understand. We wanted to answer Dr. Peterson's question. What were those things? What were those things that leaders needed to do on a regular basis to create a culture of safety? If you want to go to the next slide, please. So we spent five years in research and development to figure out what are those things they have to do. We then uh, got a third party involved to do some statistical validation on an assessment that we now have available where we can write, rate the individual safety leadership abilities of leaders within an organization and then also look collectively across the organization where we have strengths and opportunities for improvement. So we have an assessment, we have a curriculum to help leaders develop their skills. So I'm gonna ask you a few of the self-reflective questions that we ask a CEO or an executive. And if you're not the CEO, you can be one for the next few minutes. Even if you're not a top leader, I want you to think about your influence, formal leader or otherwise, on the people that you work around. So rate yourself on these questions from five to one, five being strongly agree, one strongly disagree. If there's anything that you are a three or below, I want you to really think about why that is. Under my leadership, the job description for all employees includes safety activities on which they are measured that exist today. Under my leadership, safety is integrated into the way we run our business. As a leader, I discuss safety with employees in regularly scheduled business meetings. Is it at the top of the agenda? Under my leadership, our workplace is safe because of the decisions we make as a team, as a leadership team. As a leader, I'm perceived as someone who cares about employee safety. How do they know you care? Under my leadership, incidents and injuries are not a normal cost of doing business. It's not just going to happen. As a leader, I clearly communicate that I do not expect production at the expense of safe work practices. Under my leadership, safety is a core value. I want you to think about your responses there. How did you rate yourself? Would you be willing to ask those questions of the people that report to you and look at that data? Hmm. That is well, reflected in the, the bottom right-hand corner of the slide there in that little pie chart where our leaders get that data set back. Would you be willing to reflect on what they've told you, what they've shared with you about the way that you're leading? Aren't they worth it? What really strikes me, Justin, you, I mean, those are some pretty powerful mile markers um, to sort of reflect on. Um, and earlier you talked about uh, would, would, from a financial standpoint, there are certain things, there's a financial cost to things or a financial toll depending on circumstances. But this is, um, we're talking about, the, it's the human toll connected um, to everything else. Those are, those are good points to reflect on, absolutely. Yeah, the absence of safety is certainly costly to a business. The human price is something that we can't put a price tag on. 
So here is the first homework assignment. Uh, Rusty mentioned at the top of this, that this presentation is going to be available with a QR co code at the end, but I want you to take this away. Maybe these are conversation starters for you. Is it part of your performance reviews? What do your conversations about safety focus on? Is it about things we can control or things that happen unintentionally? And when is the last time you provided positive recognition for a safety activity? Hmm, more on that in a few minutes. I've got some tactical tips now. Uh, it's tough to be a leader. It's tough to manage safety or to change the way that you've led. But here are some tactical activities you can take away if you're a leader. Develop, maintain, oversee overall business strategy with safety as a critical component. If you're in the construction field, is safety integrated into the bid process before you ever mobilize, go on site to start a construction project? Integrate safety into the regular business conversations with everybody, including your direct report, uh, meeting agendas, regular company communications. Safety should be right there, front and center with everything else that's important to you as a business leader. Demonstrate the same PPE expectations as your employees. If you want them to be in a hard hat and steel toes and gloves when they're out there in the work environment, you should be doing the same thing when you're out there in the same environment. Show up at safety meetings and training sessions occasionally to demonstrate your support for the effort. And if you're a leader, you shouldn't be sitting on your phone checking your email. You should be engaged if you expect others to be engaged. Show up in open training sessions with a word of support, encouragement, and setting those expectations, talking about why this is important. Not that it's because a regulatory agency says we have to do it, but why is it important? Get to the heart of it, that you care. You want to see them go home safely to their families. Ask employees open-ended questions about safety concerns, their victories, their contributions. Ask them about their work processes, and that will help to get their engagement. And then listen and respond. Spend more time talking about what employees have done right than what they've done wrong. And I'll give you some more pointers on that in a few minutes. And I, I love the fact, Jason, you've, you're sort of breaking this down into elements. And so far today, learning those elements of an effective organization, how to personally demonstrate uh, a commitment to safety. But let's maybe move out in the production facility or to the, the job site. And the question being, how do we then drive, how does a leader drive consistent performance out of their workforce, out of their employees? How do you drive that change? It starts with that visible commitment, right? We have to first and foremost decide that we're not satisfied with where we are when it comes to safety. We want to get better. And then what we found is that that intention is good. The commitment is good. Communication through words and deeds is good. But what works better is if you have a systemic systematic approach based on proven business processes. And so that's one thing we help our customers do is implement change through proven processes. I mentioned earlier that five-year research and development pro project we went through. And what we determined was that there are four, we call them domains of safety leadership. These things, when are uh, implemented on a consistent basis by our leaders, tend to have better outcomes when it comes to safety. The first one is accountability, a leader's ability to drive accountability. The second one is the leader's ability to create connectedness. The third is that they can demonstrate credible consciousness. And the fourth is that, fourth is that they build trust. And I wish we had enough time to go into all four of those, but I think we're going to have to schedule a second session to get through all four of the domains of safety leadership. So we're gonna focus this morning on the first one, which is accountability, because accountability is the strongest predictor of creating a safe place to work. And my simple definition of accountability is, I know what's expected of me. I, am, I have the tools and skills to do it. Someone pays attention to the way I do it, and then I get feedback, simple definition. And when people hear the term accountability applied to safety and employees hear that, they can recoil sometimes, they can bristle because they think accountability for safety means somebody's gonna get in trouble because of their behavior. But we flip that on its head, we turn it into something positive. So a more scientific definition is on the next slide and it's got four components. Number one, we have to clearly define the roles for everybody in the organization around an activity. The second step is that we have to train and provide resources, we have to equip them to do what we have defined. 
Then we need to measure that it's done and then it's done with quality. And finally, we respond with appropriate feedback. I want you to think about this model, not in terms of safety, but first in terms of manufacturing. If we want to build a tractor, everybody in a, in a facility needs to know what their role is from our logistics folks that get the materials to the right place at the right time, fabrication that has to cut out the steel, weld it to extremely tight tolerances before they pass it on to the paint booth and they apply coatings with a specific thickness to ensure durability. And then we put it into assembly and we have to torque everything to the right standards to make sure that it lasts. That's what we have to define first. Everybody has a clearly defined role. Then we have to provide people with the tools, the resources, the training to make sure they can do it because that doesn't happen haphazardly. You might get something at the end that is yellow, but it might not look like a D8 bulldozer, right? It, and Justin, as you move through this, um, Dan Rosenbarger on Facebook said something pretty astute. It, it be the change you want to see. Yes. I love that, Don. Thanks. Thanks very much. Don's an old friend of mine. Glad you're, you're with us this morning. So after we've defined expectations, we've provided training and resources, we have to make sure that it happens. So our leaders need to measure not only the quantity, but more importantly, the quality, the way the work gets done, if we expect to happen again with quality in the future. We're extremely focused on quality here at Caterpillar. We have to set those expectations, measure that it happens. So out on the production line, there are a lot of quality checks where we're measuring that everything was done to spec. And then our leaders, if we want those things to be repeated, we should be responding with appropriate feedback, either coaching to improve the performance of those defined expectations or recognition for the way they were done. That sends a powerful psychological message. It floods us with all these feel-good hormones, and we're much more likely to repeat that desired expected behavior in the future. I'm going to give a little more reinforcement to that last step of accountability in a moment. But now let's think about how do we apply this mechanism of accountability to safety? Next slide. We use this analogy called the safety river. If you want to improve your downstream results, which are your lagging indicators, things like injury rate, right? The temptation that a lot of organizations have is they place goals and targets around those lagging indicators. If you want to animate the slide, please. But there's, there's a potential pitfall there because if you place an injury reduction target on the shoulders of an operations leader, you say we want to have a 25% reduction in our recordable injuries this year, that can drive a loss of morale. If we feel like we can't control the outcome of something we're being measured by, we become disengaged. We become demoralized. It devolves the culture. So you have to focus on things that employees can do on a consistent basis, things we can define, we can train, we can measure, we can respond to. There are these upstream leading indicator activities, if you'll animate the slide, that our leaders can measure, things they can impact. And if you look at this list, there's probably things that you're doing today having engaging safety meetings, housekeeping, doing near miss investigations. And I'd ask you to consider, are they having the desired impact on your lagging indicator outcomes? Do you know how impactful they are? Is it consistent performance across all of your departments or is it hit or miss? If you have a consistently applied mechanism of accountability, it will impact your lagging indicators in a positive way way. Now let's give you a demonstration on the next slide. Let's talk about safety meetings because just about every organization has some sort of pre-shift meeting before they get out there and get the job done. Everybody has a role to play. So what would a frontline employee do? It's not enough to just show up and sit there and wait to begin the work. They have to be actively participating if you go back to those six criteria. So they're going to attend, they're going to actively listen they're going to speak up and share their ideas about improvements that could be made if they're working on a new task for the day. What are some of those potential hazards that we can mitigate before we go to work? They're encouraging others. They're giving feedback to their peers on contributions that they make. Maybe they're even leading the meeting once in a while. But we have to clearly define the expectation for that frontline employee. Now, what about their supervisor? They have to ensure that the meetings happen. They're probably going to facilitate it or they're going to appoint people to lead the meeting. They're going to involve people asking those open-ended questions to ensure that they are engaged. They are going to document the contributions made by their team members so they can pass it up to their boss. And they're going to positively recognize those people that contributed. 
Now, what about our managers who often aren't out there on the front line? They're not out there on the construction site every day with the, the supervisors and the employees. They still have a role to play. This is really important because, again, they set the expectations of the performance of the supervisor. So maybe they attend every startup meeting once a quarter. They're paying attention to what's being said. They're positively recognizing the supervisor and any frontline employees that speak up. They're responding to any ideas or requests that come from the front line. They're following up with that frontline leader if there's anything that was asked of them. And they're sharing any of those positive contributions further up the chain, even more removed from the front line where the work happens. So our top leaders, they can be involved in something as simple as a pre-shift safety meeting by doing the following. They can attend every once in a while, but we have to define how many times. They should also be paying attention, recognizing people for their contributions. They should be measuring the middle manager on their safety activities. How many times did you show up to a safety meeting last month? That would be quantity. Quality would be, what meetings did you attend? What did you hear? Who did you recognize? They're putting that on their regular performance agendas. They're talking about it in their regular business meetings. Everyone can be connected. Everyone can have clearly defined roles. They're trained to do, they're measured by, and they're given recognition for. And Justin, I, you've said those words uh, many times so far. Recognition, positively recognize. RJ on Facebook um, says recognition does change people's attitudes, beliefs, and ideas. And as you've kind of shown there throughout the organization. So thank you, RJ. Yeah, and we're going we're gonna to hit it extra hard because I believe that is the most effective way to change behavior is by focusing on what people do right and not when they do things wrong. And that'll be the last section here this morning. So here's your next homework assignment. I want you to think about what are some activities that you can hold yourself and others accountable for? Maybe you have those leading indicators on the books today, but they're not having an, an impact as you'd like. What are some things you can do differently? How can you change it operationally to ensure that they are having impact? Now, Rusty, here's the next question. This is pretty elementary, so I think you're going to get it. Are people so. most often doing things right or doing things wrong out there on a job site or in the shop? I think I have to believe that everyone wants to do the right thing. So safely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty obvious. People are working safely most of the time. Otherwise, you're not going to be in business very long. However, most of our supervisory activities around safety focus on when people do things wrong. We should be focusing on the opposite. And our studies show us that we should be focusing on the positive things, the correct things that people are doing with a ratio of seven to one noticing and acknowledging those positive safe behaviors seven times for every one coaching opportunity. And that might seem crazy. That might seem like a stretch based on the way you've always done things. So you can start smaller than that. But once you change your mindset and you change what you're looking for when you go out there to the front line, you'll start to see lots of things that are done right. And all it takes is a minute to stop and have a conversation about everything that that person has done right and why it matters. There's a couple of different types of recognition that a lot of organizations use. There's formal and there's informal. Let's start with formal. Formal is planned. It's taken some time to put together. It's, it could be rehearsed. It is usually tied to a reward. It could be tied to something tangible like gift cards or jackets or coffee mugs or pickup trucks I've heard given away or vacations. Uh, it can be public, done in front of a, a big group of people. It is usually initiated by an authority figure because of all those things above, and it happens at a lower frequency. Maybe this is for celebrating safety milestones. Or safety recognition could be informal. It could be spontaneous, out there on the job site. It will be off the cuff. We don't plan it ahead of time and rehearse it. It will be uh, usually not tied to a tangible reward. It could be one-on-one, -on -one, or it could be in front of people, but it's typically one-on-one. -on -one. It is initiated by anybody, and it happens at a higher frequency. When I ask the audience, which one is used most frequently? I'll give them a second to answer there. What do you think it is? Is it formal or informal recognition that is used most often to reinforce safety? Well, you're right, and, and I'm, I'm a pretty informal guy, Justin, but part of a large organization, I guess I would hope a mix, but I'm, I'm going to say that the answer is probably formal. And I would agree with you. That's what we hear most often. And then when you look at the psychology 
and we ask, which one is more effective and impactful to people as individuals? Guess what? It's not the formal recognition. What's more meaningful is the spontaneous one-on-one -on -one recognition from somebody that I look up to and respect. That is much more impactful. And so it's not that you shouldn't do formal recognition, but what matters more is that informal recognition. And that is something that leaders need to be trained on most often. They need to practice it. It's those words and deeds that Abby spoke about that help contribute to that psychological safety that Jenny talked about in our first session. It's something we have to train our leaders to do. So here are five characteristics of positive, effective recognition. Number one, it has to be timely. It should be done in the moment. When you see somebody do something safely, stop and recognize it on the spot. You can still bring it up to a larger team, maybe at the end of the shift or tomorrow morning, but it's much more effective in, in, the, uh, in the moment. Number two, it's relevant, meaning it's very specific to what they're doing. It's, hey, I saw you use that team lift. Thanks for not trying to pick that up on your own. I know it takes more time to go get somebody else to help you, but that's going to save your back in the long run. It's specific. Number three, it is sincere. It has to be sincere. So tell them why it's important, not because it's an OSHA regulation or because it's a safety policy. Why is it important to you? Because they matter to you. Be sincere. Number four, it's confirmed, meaning we allow them to respond to that recognition. We give them the time to respond in the form of a conversation. So we know why we were given the recognition in the first place. And the last one is that it is frequent. Again, that ratio is seven to one. It's something that we have to practice. Uh, a mine manager that I worked with out in Wyoming uh, told me that he started this little technique because he wanted to develop a new habit around recognizing people. So he started carrying seven coins in his right pocket and throughout the day as he was out there in the shop or out there at uh, the crusher, he's out there in the pit, he would notice and acknowledge safe behaviors and move a coin to his left pocket until he created this habit of focusing on what people were doing right. Here's my three keys to success. Number one, as soon as you see it, say it. Call it out in a timely, sincere, specific way. Number two, reward has to be significant enough to change employee behavior. You don't need to include a reward. Recognition is more effective without a reward tied to it. But if you're going to use a formal reward, seek input from the people that you're going to be rewarding because they might not care about a coffee mug or a jacket. Ask them what they would like. And what we find most often is that it's not the tangible, it's the intangible. They just want to be acknowledged for their personal contributions. And number three, don't you ever, ever, ever tie rewards to injury rate targets, ever, ever, ever. Because all that does is tempts people to hide the small things, which leaves you exposed to much bigger, more significant things happening down the road. Tie that recognition to the things that they can control, those safety activities from the safety river. Your final homework for the day is to think about some of those activities and behaviors that you can recognize others for. Well, and I think, it, and, and as folks sort of think through this and do this on their own, um, you made that point, Justin, you have to make it your own. One, you can be trained to think I think I lost you there, Rusty. You can be trained to do these things, uh, but it's something that you have to practice. It's something that has to be reinforced over time. If we could go to the next slide, we'll wrap this up. So where do we go from here? We've covered a lot of ground, right? We talked about what does good culture look like from a philosophical standpoint. We've also talked about ways to personally demonstrate our commitment to safety. How do we turn our intentions into actions in a consistent manner? We've talked about how to reinforce that from an operationalized standpoint with accountability that matters, accountability for the things we have control over. And that can seem like a lot to take in, but you don't have to do it alone. I would be happy to explore with you how to manage safety as a system. If you go to the next slide, please. How do we manage safety as a system? How do we develop these processes that are really important and effective uh, to the people that are out there 
on the front line? How do we manage safety as not a bolt-on that is only touched by the safety department, but how do we integrate it throughout all of our departments and all of our divisions? How do we bring our leaders along with us? How do we train them to communicate better with words and deeds and build impactful communication strategies? How do we utilize continuous improvement? How do we get our employees involved in developing these processes that govern how they work with better outcomes? How do we, how do we integrate learning and development, not just on policies and procedures, but on the way that we interact with each other to make us a better, stronger culture overall? And if we're going to use technology, how do, how do we enable that technology uh, to make us more efficient and more effective? has hey, to be managed as a system. Justin, I just wanted to make sure you can hear me that I'm back. You're back. Oh, that's that's excellent. And thank you for sort of getting into this. That was the question I had when I think I went out it is sort of those next steps. And, you know, so what now? And, and what, what can a leader do next? So I'll let you continue. Thank you. It's certainly a journey, but you have to start the journey. You have to realize that if you're not satisfied with where you are today, you're struggling with those aches and pains. There's got to be new tools, new ways, new mindsets that you can employ to get you to where you want to go. And if we look at Caterpillar's journey on the next slide, this is our recordable injury frequency. That's the top tier metric that measures how well we're doing, although that's not the tool we use to drive performance. It is the result that we're all looking for. And as you look at this journey in those first few years, this is from 2003 to present, you see big stepwise change. That was Caterpillar recognizing that we had to do things differently. We had a big executive driven strategic imperative projects, focusing on compliance around the world. Didn't matter what uh, regulatory jurisdiction you were under, everyone had the same sheet of music to play off of when it came to safety. And we started focusing on uh, ergonomics and building safety into job expectations. And then we hit that plateau that I mentioned earlier at about a recordable injury frequency of one, meaning 1% 1 of our employees were sustaining an injury that was significant enough that they had to seek medical treatment beyond first aid. And that wasn't good enough. And that's when we realized we had to focus more on culture and leadership. We needed a new tool set to do that. And Caterpillar went out and bought a company uh, that had been doing it since the 1970s, working with Dr. Peterson and incorporating his teaching into processes that changed companies cultures and you can see what's happened since we've uh, adopted that same mindset and those processes within our own four walls we've had another 60 percent reduction in recordable injuries and we're not done yet we'll never be done we'll never be done because safety never stops if you go to the next slide i've got one more one more slide here i just want you to remember that as goes the leader, so goes the employee. In the eyes of those frontline employees, their supervisor is the company. That's what influences those expectations. That's what drives those attitudes, beliefs, and ideas that shapes the behaviors that gives you results you're seeing today. But we can't just put it on the supervisor, the mid-level managers, the executives. Everyone has a role to play. So what will you do to demonstrate your commitment to safety? It, and Justin, it all sorts it sort of leads to, and I, that's why I love the exercises that you're taking everyone through. It, it requires a look in the it requires a look in the mirror moment. You you have to really figure out for yourself um, as a leader of your company or your business where you want to go, how you want to get there, how you want to bring people along. But it, it, it requires a lot of um, um, reflection on yourself reflection and then action, which takes courage. It takes courage to change the way that you lead. So I think probably a question that some who are watching are, are asking, and it's, it's that very simple, basic, how do I get my employees involved in safety? And I imagine that's one of the big questions you'll hear when you go out and work with companies or go out to a job site and talk with a supervisor or a foreman. How do I get my folks in involved and committed to it? One of the first things that we do when we start our interaction with a new customer of ours is to go out and ask questions. Go out to the job sites, go out to the factories and ask questions about what are they seeing? What are they hearing? 
What are the things that they care about? What are the things that concern them? That's the first thing to do is to get the voice of the customer because that is a reflection of those attitudes, beliefs, and ideas. Once you have that data, as a leadership team, you need to be willing to accept what they've told you. And then the most critical part is that you do something with that feedback because that's a gift from the people that are out there closest to the risk, doing their best for you as a leader, as a company. You have to be willing to change the way that you're leading and managing your business. And then there are lots of ways to get employees involved. We use a process where we have continuous improvement teams and safety steering teams that become the guiding coalition for changing the culture. They now make the decisions. They build the strategy. They develop the key performance indicators for things they want to be measured by. They create the safety activities that determine how they work out there in the field or on the job site every day. And I don't know if there's any common denominator, Justin, but when you go out and work with these um, leaders, work with groups uh, in different companies, are there any common denominators there? Any sort of, as we say, low-hanging fruit uh, that you could sort of recognize after spending some time with them, but some low-hanging fruit that you can correct and um, um, redirect right away? One of the most revealing things when I go out and I talk to groups of leaders is this focus on the positive. It's not a natural thing for us humans to do. We have developed evolutionary, evolutionarily to look for things that are dangers to us, hazards to us, the unexpected, the things that are outside of what we've trained and set expectations for. And we tend to gravitate towards those negative things and correct them. And it's not that we stop correcting things, but when we focus more on those positive things, those things we've defined for people and that we've trained them to do, we stop and acknowledge those. It sends a really powerful message that that's what my boss cares about the most. I'm going to be sure to do it that way again because my boss acknowledged it. So focusing on the positive is usually a big eye opener for leaders and it takes intentionality. But that is one of your best tools for driving that employee behavior. Yeah, that's great. And with a couple of minutes left, I, I do want to work in at least one more question. Um, and here's one that's come in. How do I get my company to focus beyond rules and policies? And that may go to the heart of you have to live and breathe this, these things that we're talking about, all these different elements. Right. It starts with an individual. Most often you have to start living out these things we've talked about today. The second thing is it takes some courage and bravery to have that conversation with your leaders about what you're not satisfied with and why, and then pointing them to resources that can expand their way of thinking. Most often what we find, it's not the, the leaders, um, it's not their fault. They've never thought about managing safety with a, a more human or cultural perspective. They've thought about rules and regulations because that's what they get measured by by regulatory agencies. So if you can point them to resources, to expand the way that they think about how safety should be measured, that is where I would start. And we have free resources. There's free resources out there um, uh, through our YouTube page, through our, our website, cat.com slash safety. Uh, I would personally be more than willing to have a conversation with your leaders if you're willing to do that and take them through some of these same principles we talked about today and have them reflect on how are they managing safety? How are they individually uh, committed to safety and what can they do differently? Sure. Justin, very well said. And we've got a slide up with uh, your uh, email information as well. And I know that uh, participants can get to that QR code to get more information, the copy of the presentation. I know you would love to continue the conversation. We knew the hour would go quickly, my friend. Thanks so much for sharing this information, that practical advice, um, those strategies that the leaders who we hope are participating can take away and, and, and go back to begin those conversations um, to truly demonstrate that strong connection, as you've said, from the front office uh, to the front line. These are certainly important conversations to have. So, Justin, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Great to be with you. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Absolutely. And we'll make sure we put up that slide, too, if you want to contact Justin and um, you can certainly go to cat.com slash safety leadership as well. Um, and before we go, I want to remind everyone, please put this on your calendar. Tuesday, July 14th. That's our final webinar session. Um, this will not be a live session, but recorded. We'll be posting it on the 14th. 
helping provide you with uh, some additional educational safety, leadership advice, and, and lessons. This session is devoted to mental health on the job site, understanding mental health issues in the construction industry, uh, how you as leaders can watch for warning signs to support your employees and promote overall workplace and job site safety. Again, that will be posted out there Tuesday, July 14th. And again, we'll leave up that QR code to get more information. All of the presentations, you can also go to cat.com uh, slash safety leadership. And with that, thanks so much, everyone, for Caterpillar and Caterpillar Safety Services. I'm Rusty Dunn. Take care. Stay, sa stay safe, everyone. We'll talk soon.